small-scale honey processing operation. For a beekeeper with under 30 hives, this is perfectly adequate. But bee businesses have a way of getting bigger and bigger, and if this happens to you, there may come a day when you need to upgrade. We're going to visit the honey processing facility of David Kelly of Shadydale, Georgia. David owns a growing mid-sized bee operation with about 300 colonies. David specializes in producing tulip poplar, clover, and sourwood honey. Large-scale honey processing does not differ fundamentally from what you saw earlier. We still must uncap combs, process the wax, centrifuge the combs, clarify the honey, store it, and bottle it. In David's operation, however, we see a higher level of labor-saving automation. First, he stacks supers in the honey house and makes sure that he doesn't mix varieties. Remember, in this part of the country, sourwood honey brings a premium price, so he doesn't want to blend it with other honeys. He uncaps into a device that melts the cappings and separates the liquid wax from the honey. Next, uncapped combs are loaded in a 20-frame extractor, a big step up from our four-frame hand crank model. By turning a switch, an electric motor spins the combs. David adjusts the speed upward as the combs empty. From the extractor, honey flows through a pipe into a clarifier and sump tank. The tank is heated, so honey is thinned and debris rises to the surface. Baffles hold back the scum, and honey flows underneath the baffles and comes out cleaner on the other side. A float switch signals the pump to turn on, and honey is pumped from the sump clarifier, through filter chambers, and into either a storage tank or a bulk barrel. A hand truck is indispensable for moving these 600-pound barrels of honey. The Kelly operation annually produces premium comb honey. One type of comb honey, called chunk honey, is simply a piece of comb honey cut to fit inside a jar and surrounded with liquid honey, one of the most beautiful and delicious products of agriculture. Representing a new generation of growing beekeepers, David Kelly is excited about his work, and he has some good insights to offer other beekeepers. Set your business up around doing as much of it as you can by yourself. Then, if you're fortunate enough to show a profit and to grow and you eventually outgrow that, that's fine. If you're making the money to afford the help, that's okay. That's one thing, but you're not going to just start off small and hire people and expect to make money at it. And there you have it, the rewards of our labors, a honey crop from the beehive to the marketplace. Honey is a product without peer, wholesome, locally unique, and always delicious. Beekeepers must always protect honey's good image. Remember, it's at its absolute best when it's still in the hive. Here's some important highlights about processing honey. Only harvest honey between 15.5 to 18.6 percent moisture and keep it that way during processing. Use a cool smoker in the field during harvest to keep cinders out of the honey. Never heat honey above 145 degrees Fahrenheit or else you risk harming its color and flavor. Avoid debris and lint in honey by keeping it covered and using synthetic fabric for strainers. Avoid free fall in the extracting process that incorporates tiny air bubbles into the honey. Use clean, standard honey jars. Use a professionally printed label. Never let jars get sticky on the outside. And finally, all honey will granulate with time, and this is perfectly normal. To reliquify it, take off the lid, set the jar in a pan of water, and heat it on a stove. Now that the honey season is over, we look ahead to next year. As you might guess from the title of this series, we follow the progress of these same ten hives throughout the upcoming fall, winter, and spring. In our next show, you'll see how we prepare hives for fall, 
We'll watch them through winter, and if everything goes okay, get them ready next spring for another honey flow. Maybe this time we'll get a tulip poplar crop. I'm glad you could be with me today. Join me next time as we continue A Year in the Life of an Apiary.